successfully. Just south of Beirut, Lebanon, is Damour. Everybody living here today came from Tal al Zata. Zatar means in Arabic the hill of Thin. It is in the eastern suburb of Beirut. It is an area of one kilometer long. It is a valley. It is not a hill. It is called so, but it is a valley. Surrounded by many hills. It is an area of one kilometer in width and three kilometers long. And it was occupied by Palestinian refugees who came in 1948 with some poor Lebanese. And mostly in Lebanon, the poor Lebanese used to live in these areas where the Palestinians, because, you know, with uh, cottages and, and slum areas, as you call it. The population of the camp was 30,000. 17,000 of them were Palestinians, 13,000 Lebanese. Neighboring to Tel Zatar, there was a Lebanese quartal called Ras al Dikwani. And uh, from the other side, there was a big number of factories because in this area concentrated about 25 percent of the Lebanese industry and it is uh, known that because here they have workers I mean uh, cheap manpower in this area can encourage uh, 
industrials to have their industries in this area. of the students together here uh, help us to return back the smile for um, the faces of these children because most of them have lost their parents uh, most of them lose two or three of the sisters and brothers in the battle in Tarzan. <laughs> place to stay. So we come to the Amur Mu'akkatan uh, temporary. Dr. Labadi and the team worked in Tel Al Zata all the way through the period which began with the attack in January 76, the blockade. And the work of the Red Crescent clearly was what enabled the people and fighters of Tel Al Zata to resist for so long and so heroically. 
Will you tell the story of Tal al Sata from the work of the Red Crescent, from the heart of the camp? You see, the geographical situation of Tal al Zatar found in the middle of the right wing organization's area had put big responsibilities on the Red Crescent Society to exert much effort in building a god hospital with good equipments because maybe we were expecting such a siege. So they built a hospital there, or we built a hospital there, which costs us more than a million Lebanese pounds. This hospital was, of course, in underground conditions. The capacity of 40 beds with operative theater, with emergency room, with radiology center, pharmacy, laboratory, good laboratory, and uh, enough or sufficient stuff, medical stuff. But unfortunately, it was difficult for us to have enough doctors there because it was a dangerous area and many doctors refused to work there. For me and uh, for Dr. Labadi, it was a challenge. And we decided by all by our own will to go there. I was there in August and he came before me two weeks. And we have done a study for the social and the medical and the sanitary situation of the camp and starting putting a plan for the camp. Starting from preventive medicine, from sanitary situation, because it was a camp of open canalization, many children playing in rubbish and so on, and this, of course, makes the sanitary situation worse. So we started from this point, for example, removing the rubbish and cleaning the canalization and giving instructions to the people how to manage. We have a campaign against scabies inside the camp, because you know this scabies, mm. or itching as they call it, it is mostly in such areas, because the camp is overcrowded with people. It is uh, small cottages with very narrow alleys, with open canalization, Majority of the population is children, you know, the families, most we have, the members of the family, the average, it is eight to ten, and mostly they are children. So, in these days where we have enough time, we pressed or we have stress on preventive medicine, on qualifying our personnel. But at the beginning, there was difficulty in personnel because uh, we haven't enough so we started our intensive courses of first aid for practical nursing and for uh, operative stuff and we are proud that our personnel were ex carpenters students blacksmiths and so on and within two or three months, we were able to have uh, about 30 good qualified nurses who helped us so much that we didn't feel that we are only two doctors. We work in a power of 20 doctors at that time. And if you know that we have received or admitted in our hospital more than 6,000 casualties. You can understand that 
the work with the nurses and the personnel was very great. The first siege was in January, and it was a siege where they prevent any kind of food supply or other means of supply to the camp. And there were battles and fights at that time, and the road opened for a couple of days. And then started the second siege. You said you treated about 6,000 casualties. What kind of wounds and mm -hmm. infectious diseases were you having to deal with during the 55 days? Mm -hmm. During the 55 days, we have mostly the war injury, uh, especially the shrapnels, because it was a very heavy and severe bombardment. You know, that 60,000 bombs within two months in the camp fall, had fallen. Moreover, there was severe diseases just like gas gangrene. We have cases of tetanus. And the most dangerous for us in the last days was the dehydration of the children. You know, the last 15 days, we have only 20% of the water supply. And even this 20% of water supply was from one source, which is very close to the positions of the phalanges. And I know that when the people, when the mothers go by nights to fetch water, they just uh, said to each other farewell, because the, nobody knows if he is coming back or not. And we have the martyrs of water. We have a daily average of 15, 17. One day we had 37, because the phalangists used to throw bombs on this source of water. And in spite of that, mothers, people were trying to get water. One time, they brought me a mother with a bucket of water in her, on her head. And she was a sniper in her hand. But she's still holding this bucket of water. And she came to the hospital, and with great difficulty, we could release this bucket. Because she was uh, very happy that she got some water. And uh, she was not paying attention even to the injury. The most important for her was that she got water. So this was the situation for the water. The last 48 hours, we have no water at all. And we have, the last days, we have a daily average of 10 to 12 children dying daily. Mothers brought their children just like that. It is skin and blue in Arabic cell. And doctor, what can I do? And I know that they need water. They need milk, they need water. Even this we can't uh, ensure for them. So they, all of them tell me, shall I prepare for him a, a tube? It was very difficult for me to answer such questions, right? because I know that they need water. So the problem of water was a striking one. And this put us in a very bad situation because we were not defending inside the camp, not the alleys, not the windows, not the doors. We were defending the people, and especially the children. So what we can do if they are dying in front of our eyes? How much water were you able to give? to those you were looking after in the hospital? In the, 
You see, a glass of water has to pass for 10, between 8 to 10 wounded people. Everyone can have maybe one mouthful, and that's all, because it was very rare. And we have to give them water, especially those cases with abdomen injuries. You know, we have no infusions, so we used to give them with a spoon. Every a couple of minutes, we give them two milliliters of water because they can't eat, they can't. So we give them water by teaspoons every couple of minutes. And uh, this, of course, affects the situation of the wounded greatly. But uh, I say that uh, mostly involved were the children, the small children, because they can't stand the water loss, like adults. So we see them, or we saw them vanishing in our eyes. They are dying slowly. Or they were dying slowly. How did you manage for drugs and dressings with the blockade and the siege? You see, uh, the first 10 days we were obliged, after the first 10 days of siege, we were obliged to evacuate the hospital for certain purposes. First, the roads to the hospital were very dangerous. The underground conditions without electricity was very bad for the wounds, and the hospital was overcrowded. And we were afraid that the hospital would be taken over by the other side because it was it was in the front. So we evacuated the hospital to another place. At that time, or with this time, or with that time, we have a big deficiency in drugs because the great number of wounded and we were planning to have medical supply to the camp but we succeeded to have one truck passed in this is in the first after the first siege but we didn't succeed to have the rest of the medical supply of course at the beginning we started our uh, own uh, infusions. We make infusions by ourselves, especially glucose and normal saline when there is electricity. But after that, with no conditions of sterilization, no electricity, with the big deficiency in drugs, we started using the hypertonic solutions, water and salt. Of course, we have big deficiency in the medical materials, the glues, the cotton, for dressing. So we started using the curtains, the sheets, and the clothes for dressing as a dressing material. What helped us is the penicillin, because we had only the penicillin. Even uh, it helped us up to the, I mean, only the last 15 days we have no drugs at all but we have to that extent penicillin but what penicillin can do for all these uh, wounds especially we have severe infections on the chest and the abdomen we have gas gangrene we have tetanus we have head uh, injuries brain injuries and the hospital we were able to do operations major operations even but later on with the loss of the drugs, with the loss of infusions, with the loss of sterile conditions, we were obliged to do only life-saving operations. One time, our, one of our nurses wanted to evacuate a casualty, which was uh, near our emergency center. She, she ran to that position, and suddenly a bomb fell near her, and she had a very big thigh injury. We wanted to, of course, there was an arterial bleeding with arterial cut. 
so we wanted to operate here. But at that time, we were uh, uh, living the days of the convoys on the International Red Cross. And we were preparing here for evacuation next day. But suddenly, the evacuation of the wounded stopped for five days. And uh, we couldn't do anything for her. And uh, we lost her. During the period of January until August, what help did the International Red Cross give? Internazatar, nothing. Nothing? Nothing. The role of the International Red Cross in Talazatar was the evacuation of 465 wounded in four convoys. They didn't even allow the phalangists and the fascists, they didn't allow the Inter uh, International Red Cross to bring anything inside the camp. With the fearful injuries that you and Dr. Labidi had to deal with. How was it that you were able to carry out operations that you'd never dealt with before? I graduated a general practitioner and finished one year in surgery because I was specializing, but when the clashes began in Lebanon, I quit my specialization and came back. But of course, I have to do. I have to do, I have to do my job as a surgeon, as a dentist, as a gynecologist, as an obstetrician inside the camp, as a pediatrician. I have to do everything because there, is, there was no choice. So we succeeded to do big operations and we, have, we had good results on them. We operated in abdomen, extremities, on chest, and even on brain. And in the last 15 days you only had salt and water? On the last 15 days, we even had no salt and water. Even at the last days, we used to tell the people, the relatives of the wounded, to bring us a bottle of water and a little bit of salt in order that we can do dressing for the relatives of the wounded we had. How many people in Tel Azata died before the evacuation? Before the day of the evacuation, we lost 2,500. And the last day, only the day of evacuation, we lost about 1,000 people. We don't know their destiny till now. But myself, I was a witness, an eyewitness of the massacre. I have seen hundreds of dead bodies, starting from the entrance of the camp up to the museum area. As you know that that day, they have 12 control points. And in these 12 control points, they used to liquidate mostly the males. And I have seen the bodies of pregnant women, Old people, children, and my nurses. Because they shot my nurses in front of my eyes. These are the pictures of them. I will not forget that moment at all. And I don't know what is civilization. Those people count themselves as the representatives of the European civilization in the Middle East. I don't know if the European world opinion agree with that. Maybe there is a new definition for civilization, I don't know. This is a question I ask to the international world opinion.
how were you able to be, to get out of the camp? It was, I was lucky. I was put to the wall to be shot with my nurses. But suddenly, one of the phalangists recognized me. I had operated him seven months before that moment on his chest because they brought him to the, our hospital. It was the nearest hospital in that area. And they recognized me and wanted to save my life. Then they started an argument. One of them wanted to shoot me, the other one wanted to save my life. And suddenly a Syrian officer put an end to their arg argument. Fortunately, I had operated him before also. So he took me and I started telling him about the nurses and he, it was in vain. He told me it is useless to save the nurses. And they were shot in front of my eyes. Of course, the evacuation of the camp was through an agreement by the Palestinian resistance on the other side. And this agreement was sponsored by the Arab peacekeeping forces and the International Red Cross. And they should come next day on 12th of August at 8 o'clock in the morning to take the children and the civilians. But at that day, there was a big trick. And the phalangists, phalangists started heavy shelling in the camp. And they double-crossed the civilians, the mothers, the children. And there was a great massacre. Of course, as far as our staff is concerned, they reached us and took us. And we succeeded to take with us 38 heavy wounded uh, patients because every one of us held, every two of us held one patient. But they killed those 38 with the nurses on that day. And through our investigation, we know that we lost a thousand people at that day. We don't know their destiny, but I have seen many dead bodies, among them my nurses. يسار ينام الإنسان على الأرض ويحط رقبته على لوحة الخشب ويقطع راسه جابوا السيارة السيارة من هون السيارة من هون ربطوه بالحبال وطلقوه جابوا محرمة كانت حبلة مع أولادها بعدين ضربوها بالسكينة صار ابنه فز من بطنه وصار يلعبط بالارض. انا انا ابني مفقود وجوزي وجوز بنتي، هذه جوزها مفقود. هاي ابنها مفقود. هاي الاخت اربع شباب وابوهم راحوا، هاي ست هاي كمان جوزها مات واخوها مات. كل واحد عندنا في عنده مشكله بحياته كل واحد لولا ما هي المصيبه جماعه يعني يمكن كنا متنا زمان بس انا مصيبتي وهي عندها مصيبه وهي عندها مصيبه وهي عندها مصيبه يعني بنشوف كل الناس عندها مصايب مثل بعضنا البعض حوالي 652 هون الاخت 14 نفر انا لي شبين 14 نفر راحوا من باب البيت ابو جعفر كمان شباب اثنين مفقودين بجوز الجريح نزل معي على تحت الدكواني اخذوه مني تحت الدكواني ونزيفه ماشي 
وين الضمير؟ وين 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 الضمير للشعر؟ نزيف وماشي البجامه اللي لابسها بعطريها دم. قال لي ما بدي تنزلي معي على الطريق لاني انا بابا قبل ان العنزاليين يذبحوك ويذبحوا اطفالي وانا عم تشوف. ما بدي تمشي معي بالطريق واخذوه مني على على تحت الدكوان. عندي سبع اطفال انا. احنا احنا كانوا يحاربونا حرب اباده. مش حرب انه اذا نزلنا سلمنا انه خلص عفوا عنا، لا بدهم يقتلوا الطفل والمراه والبنت والزلمه. When you defeated in Talazata? Isn't she in Talazata? Had to tell you that no one defeated in Talazata. No, 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 no. Hold on. Yeah. 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 Y
الانعزالية خافوا على خافوا من تل الزعتر لأنه امتدت جذوره هناك وكان تجمع فقير كثير لتفوا حواليه لهالسبب هذا ما حب يكون تل الزعتر حبوا القضاء عليه من أجل تقسيم لبنان لأنه كان واقف بطريقة تقسيم تل الزعتر والآن سيشرح الأخ أبو جعفر قصيدي عن مزاجر عن مجازر تل الزعتر وبطولات مقاتلين تل الزعتر وما جرى في تل الزعتر من جوع وعطش وتشريد وتشريد وقتل وذبح قال فيها تل الزعتر يا تل الصمود بوجه الغزاة الجردوا عليك جرود فضل ابطالك لا تلب اخلاص ما همهم لا قذيف ولا من اول رصاصة لاخر قذيفي كنت انا بالمعركة موجود مثل ما صار عم بحكي المعارك كلام الصدق ما بدها شهود اول يوم عشرين الف قذيفي نزلت على اهالي وعجنود وثاني يوم خمس عشر ألف قذيفي على المخيم تشوف الحرائق والدخان صعود وثالث يوم خفت شوي لكن ما وقفوا نصطراحوا لردود كل ما اشتدت أبطالنا تقاتل بهمي علي مثل أشبال الأسود قدر شهرين عشنا في المعارك صارت قلوبنا من حجر جلمود تنكت مي من صبح العشي والزاد صار عندنا مفعود جف لسان الطفل من العطش ويقول يا بي واموت وعد وان الصبح بيعود والولد عند الصبح يسأل وين بي جاوب المسؤول أبوك مفعود والبنت تسأل أمها وين خي قالت لها بالمتراس موجود بدافع عن الشرف والناموس يا بني والعمر بضع ساعات محدود شمس المضي وعن خدود تطف سلال ورود يحيى فتح فوزي ديمقراطي اثنيناتهم تقول جوز فهود طلعوا بالجبل ما عادوا علي ومن يوم انا حزنان مكمود يا رب يا رحمن ردن علي ورد كل لا صرت يا معبود هذا امر الله عليك وعلي رب الدالي وما نقطف العنود يا رب يا رحمن اسمع دعانا ورد علينا ومحي ليالي السود اوف يا زعتر راهن العالم عن اسراك وخذ المعركة بقوت على صراعيك <تصفيق> شعوب الحر بارك لك على صراعيك لكن خانوك حكام العرايا 
What have you learned from Del Alzata that you didn't know before? I believe more in my problem now. I believe that it is not enough to be a doctor. Sometimes you have to go deep in the social problems of your people. And I have to stand on the first frontier or line of the people, my people, and that it is not enough to dream of having your problems solved, you have to struggle for them. Oh, 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 oh,
Can you tell me about your home in Palestine? Have you ever seen your home in Palestine? عمرك شفت بيتك في فلسطين؟ لا بس أنا كان جدي يحكي لي هذا الكلام. Yeah, what is that gun you've got? هذا البارود اللي معك شو اسمه؟ كلاشينكوف. It has a lot of bullets. إلى كتير طلقة. Yes, تلاتين طلقة. Why are you doing military training? ليش عم تعملي تدريبات عسكرية؟ عشان لما أتدرب أصير مقاتلة نرجع وأحرر فلسطين وهم مش بلادنا من بلادنا فلسطين المغتصبة مع الصهيونية والح 
حرب طويلة وصعبة تنتهيش اليوم يومين سنين والعدو ما بفرق بين صغير وكبير وبتمنى أكون طفل مثل هالأطفال أطفال الدنيا اللي بيرقصوا وبيغنوا وبيعملوا حفلات ومشاوير بروحوا لكن الصهيون لكن العدو ما بيرضى وبنت عمي اجت عليها غاره صهيونيه وماتت وهي لا بتعرف عن سلاح ولا شيء وانا غصب عني حملت حملت السلاح و وعشان بنت عمي الثاني احارب واحمي نفسي وبنت عمي اللي عايشه واخواتي ورفقاتي ونفسي. Can you tell me who your enemy is؟ تقدري تقولي لنا مين العدو تبعك؟ الصهاينة مش اليهود، اليهود دي انسمة والصهاينة هي حركة عنصرية استعمارية. هذا فطرت الشعب من من أراضي. I've heard politicians from a number of countries say that Palestinians can go to another country, not Palestine, to another Arab country, for instance, Lebanon. What do you think? I mean, I haven't any. No, I not take another country. Uh, another uh, Palestine, my homeland, uh, because uh, my fathers and uh, my fathers uh, were lived uh, there, where, uh, and I don't leave uh, my uh, my homeland. But for instance, Lebanon is a very beautiful country, isn't it? No, no. I uh, shall take uh, Palestinian, my homeland. No, another. Selma, what would you do if you saw a wounded Israeli soldier? If I saw a wounded Israeli soldier, what would I do? If I saw a wounded Israeli soldier, I would help him and I would try to understand the issue of the Palestinian Palestinians and to understand that the people of the Palestinians are like the rest of the people. He has the right to be able 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 to but what if the wounded Israeli soldier tries to shoot you, tries to kill you? إذا حاول هذا الإسرائيلي الجريح يقتلك مثلاً شو بتعملي؟ ها ساعتها بيكون هذا مش جريح، ده بيكون مقاتل يعني مثل بيقولوا ضبع كاسر. workshop is a special for the revolution. The workers here are fighters. They are not uh, ordinary workers. They are ready to fight. One fight is one fight is uh, must be, and they work. One work must be. 
The workers here are like brothers. They, are, they need money. That's not the purpose. They, but they do not work for or the purpose of money. They, they can work in other places, but they prefer this place because this place here, the money are not the purpose. The, the purpose is the struggle for them. يعني هون العمل هون كمان مثل يعني أماكن شعبية هون الآن بيختلف عن أماكن الباقي هون أماكن شعبية بتختلف عن أماكن الباقي طبعا هون أول شيء الواحد بيشتغل مؤسسة تبع لأبناء شهداء فلسطين شو ما عمل إنتاج طبعا الإنتاج هذا وين بيرحى لأسر شهداء فلسطين وبصير يعطي يعني العمل الحقوق كل شيء تمام هون بعمل بعمل هون لانه وجدته افضل مكان لإلي انه اعمل فيه بين اخواني says if he works here because he finds it the best place to work between his brothers and comrades what do you like best about this workshop اكثر شيء بفضل بالعمل هون بهالمصلحه اكثر شيء بفضل بفضل هون مش مش بس حتى يعلمونا معلم الجاره حتى بناء جيل مستقبل حتى يحرر فلسطين. He says that here he first he learns a profession, then he can build he can build a new a new generation fighting for Palestine. How old are you? I am old. I am old. Fourteen years old. Thank you. clothes for all the warriors and for the summit shops. Ordinary clothes. There are summit workshops in all the camps, making furniture for the schools and the houses and the hospitals, handbags and things of leather, doing urn works, everything. We are nearly all from families of martyrs.
like this one. This one comes from Jaffa. And this one comes from Haifa. And this one from Bethlehem. And this is Jerusalem. And this is Halim. And this is Ein Gazel. Tul Karim. Ramallah. And this is Gaza. And this is Gaza. All these stitches from all these towns in Palestine. And recently, the Zionists made up an exhibition and they took it over to the United States. And they showed all this work from all these regions in Palestine. And they said this was Israeli culture. Salah, what does today, May the 15th, mean for you? Well, May the 15th uh, is, a, uh, is a strategic step in the uh, Zionist plan to take uh, Palestine from, the, from her uh, uh, real inhabitants, I mean the Palestinians. Uh, the conspiracy against our people didn't start on, the, on May 15th, it, start, it started earlier than that many years before May 15th, but on that day they realized their dream and uh, they uh, kicked out the inhabitants from Palestine. To us it's the beginning of a tragedy. We celebrate uh, May 15th every year to uh, emphasize and stress on the fact that uh, even uh, although we've been away from our country for many years now, but yet we are more determined to go back now than, uh, than ever. Why do all your united leadership insist again and again that Zionism is a threat to every ordinary peoples in the world? It's because uh, Zionism is a, a racist movement. Uh, it's the same uh, as the uh, uh, Nazism. Nazism was not a threat against the Jews themselves or the Jews only. Nazism was a threat to the whole world, the humanity. It was a bad event in the history of man. Uh, this event is repeated. Uh, that's why Zionism is not a threat to the Arabs only. It's a threat uh, to the Jews themselves. Zionism uh, is dangerous to Judaism itself. It's a racist movement. Uh, it, uh, it seeks what differentiates uh, uh, the peoples of the world. While we are in, in a time where we uh, seek what unites the peoples of the world, not what separates them, what makes uh, a certain people superior, superior to other people. So Zionism is a, is a racist movement. 
it's the same as uh, Nazism. Uh, there is a misleading propaganda, Zionist propaganda, uh, which uh, pre uh, repre uh, presents uh, Zionism as David and we as big Goliath, while the truth that we are David, they are playing the uh, uh, role of uh, big uh, Goliath. Uh, the Jews uh, were oppressed, that's true. They've been annihilated by uh, the Nazis, that's true. But now uh, the Zionists are applying the same means. They are annihilating our people. They are oppressing our people. Uh, 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 little David has grown up. He's no more uh, little David. He's armed to teeth with phantom, with, uh, with the napalm. The oppressed turn to be the oppressor now. لما طلعنا من فلسطين مش هيك؟ من خبر اليهود تحتل البلد هاي ونهرب على الثاني تحتل هون نهرب على الثاني لحتى طلعنا على بنت جبيل والشباب انا كنت عندي طرشاد بكونا بنت جبيل وطلعنا صارت الطياره تحم علينا تضرب علينا النام هيك كانوا العنزين غنميت معي فكتم ملكيت امراه صرت بحد جبل هيك بالحجر وارطي وهي تحوم تحوم الطياره فوقينا هاي من وين الطياره؟ الطياره لليهود اسرائيليه اسرائيل شو كان الانجليز يسووها هناك؟ الانجليز بقوا يجي يكون نفوت هون نروح نفوت نلاقي كان ما في شيء ما في شيء يهود انت بستنى هون نروح نلاقي اليهود نفوت انا نفوت ينزروا النفخ يضرب فينا كل طويل عمر طيين في هذا يهدم هيك وهذا يروح هيك الشر بتاعنا عن بعضنا يعني الشر بتاعنا عن بعضنا استحدوها اليهود عملوا صفوا الشباب ميت شب قالوا له انت بحشو بحشو كل واحد قبر بايده بالطنطورة القبر بحشو الشباب خلصوا الميت الميت واحد صفوهن اليهود واعطوهن كله صاروا يسحبوا وحطوا كل واحد بحش قبره حطوا بقبره Here in Lebanon there are 550,000 Palestinians most of them live in the camps in Beirut there were seven camps after the war there are now four in the whole of Lebanon there are 17 and there are Palestinians dispersed all over the world no, this is before three or four years or five years. Uh, all the houses like this before the revolution. But when the revolution is uh, uh, began with our people, with our youth, they change everything here. The houses, the minds of people, the streets. Uh, our street like was uh, sand, not like this. This is also new. Sand and water. Yes, sand like this. Yes. Yeah. Sand and water and uh, every dirty, the dirt are uh, everywhere. When did you start the breeze block building? Uh, when? Yes. In 1969. Mm -hmm. By the end of May 1948, 300,000 Palestinians had been made refugees. By the end of that year, another 700,000. In less than 12 months, 85% of the Arab population of Israel had been expelled. Then came the bombarding of the Suez Canal and more expulsions. In 1967, after the June War, another 450,000 were made homeless. About the treatment of the British of the English uh, soldiers in Palestine. The treatment of the Arabs. <coughs> yes, the, no, the treatment of you, uh, your country mm. when they are uh, yield our country. Yes, the treatment the yes. British. Yes. How the British treated the yes, Arab people. They, uh, she said that in the first uh, they took our uh, beans and our uh, flour and our our eating our food. And our, uh, they killed our uh, men and our uh, sons. And they also, they took our land and gave it for uh, the foreign people who are Jewish. 
And when you left Palestine in 1948, did you come straight to Beirut? You went straight to Palestine. جيت دغري على بيروت ولا جينا على ترشيحة على ثلاثة شهور لما طلعوا على ترشيحة ضربوها طلعنا على رماش ومن رماش جينا على بيت حون ومن بيت حون جينا على سور من سور لعنجر ومن عنجر لطرابلس When they leave the Palestine, they come from her country, Cabrish, from Cabrish, to our to Tarshiha. Then from Tarshiha to Huli, Irmish. Then to Irmish. From Irmish to Azhar. From Azhar to Trablus. From Tripoli. From Tripoli to Beirut. Seven countries she had passed by them. And now, how long has your family been here in Bush Parashni? It's just a little bit longer. Twenty-two years. Also, here is the flower. Look what's right here. Right, Fatah. Oh yes, Fatah. Here, at the door. Yes, Fatah. Yes, Fatah. Yes, Fatah. This is the thing. This is the thing. Yes, when uh, they began to kill us, we hide here. Uh, thousands of uh, children sleep here uh, from uh, killing. How many shelters did you build in this camp? Uh, about uh, 12. For how many children? How many children? Yeah. About 30,000. <laughs> Our life is too miserable, but it is too powerful. Look, we are also trees. Okay, also trees. But the Palestinian man uh, like uh, trees too much. Like uh, to plant everything and uh, everywhere. In sand, the earth, in uh, good earth, in bad earth, but by his hand, he can make it good. They say the Palestinian revolution was born in the camps. A nation was born in the camps. Small star in uh, our camp for selling clothes. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Moi, je considère que tout ce qui s'est passé au Liban, ça a été une, une intervention du communisme international chez nous, parce que nous étions un des pays les plus heureux au monde. Notre paysan, notre ouvrier, notre, notre, euh, nos lois sociales, nous arrivions à nous rapprocher des pays les plus évolués au monde. Malgré que nous n'ayons pas de richesse naturelle, ni pétrole, ni sous-sol, nous avions réussi à faire de notre économie la meilleure économie du Moyen-Orient. Mais et le Liban était le seul pays dans tout le Moyen-Orient où il y avait cette liberté, il y avait cette démocratie. Dans aucun pays arabe, vous ne trouverez la démocratie et la liberté qu'il y avait au Liban. Et naturellement, peut-être ça gênait le communisme international qui a, voulu, euh, qui a voulu faire sauter ce régime pour nous aligner à la, à, euh, au, régime, à, euh, au régime communiste. Et nous autres, nous avons considéré que le régime communiste est le régime social pour un pays qui a sa richesse, qui tire sa richesse de l'initiative privée et des capitaux investis au Liban. Cette richesse qui est le capital, qui est l'initiative privée et les capitaux étrangers ne peuvent pas aller avec, ni avec le communisme ni avec le socialisme. Alors malheureusement, nous avons eu à lutter contre le communisme international. Et je, suis, je crois que nous avons eu le dessus, malgré la force extraordinaire qu'avait le communisme international. Et je crois que nous avons été les seuls à battre le communisme international euh, au Liban.
Vous savez que j'ai commencé ma vie, moi, comme sportif. J'étais le capitaine de l'équipe de football, j'étais le président de la fédération euh, libanaise de football. Et comme tel, nous avons eu à euh, assister aux Olympiades de Berlin en 1936. Eh bien, je ne vous cache pas que j'ai été impressionné par la discipline qu'il y avait et par la tenue et par le sens national. Maintenant, cette impression n'a rien à voir avec la doctrine nazie, ni avec la doctrine euh, hitlérienne, et avec la doctrine... Euh, nous avons, comme je vous disais tout à l'heure, c'est le parti, c'est un des partis les plus démocrates dans tout le Moyen-Orient. Et je vous disais tout à l'heure que pendant ces 30 dernières années, par exemple, entre 1943 et 70, certainement, nous avions réussi à faire de ce pays un pays modèle, et je le dirai en toute modestie encore, un pays modèle pour le monde entier. Et c'est malheureux que le, la, la gauche internationale, qui se sert de toutes les idées, de, tous les, de toutes les choses mystiques, par exemple, et se servit de la justice sociale pour s'introduire, qui... Quel est l'homme raisonnable, quel est l'homme juste et honnête qui ne soit pas pour la justice sociale Prenez par exemple le cas de la question palestinienne. Ils se sont servis de la question palestinienne pour s'introduire ici. La guerre chaude au Liban est terminée, mais la guerre chaude dans la région n'est pas terminée. Nous ne pouvons dire que la guerre est terminée au Liban avant que le problème israélo-palestinien ne soit complètement résolu et avant que la, la résistance palestinienne ne soit totalement désarmée au Liban. Les gardiens de Sèvres est un parti militaire et politique. Les causes de la guerre, on les a expliquées, c'était les hordes palestiniennes qui sont venues au Liban pour prendre le Liban des Libanais et que nous avons décidé de détruire ces hordes pour ne pas être détruits. La guerre n'est pas terminée puisque les palestiniens sont encore sur nos territoires. Le Liban sud est sous leur domination. Comme nous avons libéré une très grande partie du Liban, nous allons libérer le reste et nous continuerons la lutte jusqu'à ce qu'il n'y ait plus aucun palestinien sur notre territoire. Pour nos slogans, qui étaient un peu durs pour tout le monde, mais une fois qu'ils comprennent la cause de cette guerre, ils nous comprendront. Aucun Libanais sur le territoire libanais qui n'ont pas voulu quitter, nous avons décidé de les détruire. Et à chaque Libanais de tuer un Palestinien et aucun Palestinien sur terre. Pourquoi détruire les enfants et les vieux les enfants avant les vieux, parce que cet enfant qui a 5 ans, dans 10 ans, refera la guerre à mes enfants. Et nous sommes obligés de défendre au moins nos enfants. Donc, qu'il y ait un enfant à moins, ce sera déjà une perte et un bénéfice de, de côté de nos enfants, à moins faire la guerre plus tard. Pourvu que nous finissons avec tous les Palestiniens sur nos territoires, et même sur tous les terrestres, c'est mieux. On n'a pas détruit tout ce qu'on possède, nos banques, nos établissements et tout ce qu'on possédait. Chacun de nous possédait pas mal de millions de livres qui les a détruits par lui-même. Ce n'est pas pour arrêter la guerre tant que le palestinien est là. Nous continuerons cette guerre jusqu'à la fin et nous la gagnerons parce que nous avons le droit et nous défendons notre peuple et notre patrie. I explain English. We will continue the war still and any Palestinians in our land. We destroy everything, our banks, our office, everything we have we is destroyed by ourselves, not to stop the war and all the Palestinians are still in our country. We will continue it to the last Palestinians people in our land. The fascist supported by the imperialism, by the foreign forces, were aiming to crush the existence of the Palestinian.
not to let us have the right to fight against our enemies. They were aiming to crush all the rights of the Lebanese people also in uh, this country. When we were fighting against them, we were fighting for the benefit of the Palestinian existence, for the benefit of the Palestinian struggle, more than that, for the benefit of those poor people, of those who were suffering too much in their life. They were having any right to live an ordinary way of life. For that, they were supporting us. We were expressing their feelings in our fighting, and therefore they stand, they stood beside us, and they fought beside us. So, it's not the matter of Christians and Muslims, but as I am telling you, it is a, it is a conspiracy against the Palestinians and the Lebanese. And Israel is behind it. And as I have mentioned before, the CIA is against it, or is behind it. And they were planning together for this uh, crisis or this uh, uh, confrontation which had been done in Lebanon. Uh, in any case, uh, in spite of what have been done, we, we, which we, we were at the Palestinian revolution against it, but uh, we were obliged uh, to carry on our, on this uh, confrontation to defend our camps from this uh, uh, very hard attacks and you see what have been, uh, been done to Tal Sadr and Kisra Basha, these two camps, two camps, and then an example, they had been completely demolished and thousands of our uh, people had been killed only in these two camps, but uh, if we have to give Another details, you know that uh, we have great losses. But besides, we have also uh, very important experiences after what have been done. The, this relation between the, us and the masses, the Lebanese masses, uh, is a very important they point. They have to live and fight everything which prevents them from living. This is the, the smallest thing that they have to do. Uh, they fight against all the bourgeoisies and with the Palestinians because they have to, to, to do this. Uh, they, they are workers, uh, poor people, miserable people, live here in Shia. Uh, they have many, many rights the government has to do, but the, the, the government don't give them anything of that. For that reason, and for many other reasons, they, they fight in this country, and they, uh, they have to fight Every, everybody who stops in their way for a living. Uh, here in Shia, we find the workers, the jobbers, they have... These are all Lebanese workers, Lebanese Yes, families. they are all Lebanese, they are all Lebanese. This is Lebanon, here in Shia is Lebanon. Not here. the Lebanon of Jamal. No, not the Lebanon of Jamal, never, never and never. a lovely place to spend the weekend. Beirut is only half an hour away. And Damour is only 10 minutes. And Israel's only 70 miles away. Nice houses. The first one belongs to the Makawi family. 
And next to it, the Rendur chocolate family. And there's a third house. It belongs to Kamisha Moon and his two sons, Danny and Dory. Que penses-tu? Allons-y. It's very nice. But when the blockade on Beirut was lifted by the Palestinian Revolutionary Forces and the Joint Lebanese National Forces, some people came in and left a message on the fireplace of Kamish Amun, and it said, this house was built with the money of the people, and it'll go back to the people. Entering South Lebanon. This checkpoint is controlled by the Lebanese Arab Army. This is the section of the army that split and joined the progressive Lebanese forces in the Palestinian Revolution. From now on in South Lebanon, the whole country is under the control of revolutionary command of the progressive Lebanese forces and the Palestinian Revolution, headed by Fatah. From now on, everything is different property which was sold to the last owner, the present owner for 12 million pounds, and includes a little weekend cottage and 150 acres of citrus groves. 18 months ago was the last time that the present owner was here. Isn't that right? No. He wouldn't pay compensation to the laborers who were here, so since he wasn't here, the laborers occupied and occupied the cottage and have continued to work in the farm and on the citrus groves, keep the lawn up and meticulously keep everything in order until these questions are settled. Before the guerrillas came to this region of Lebanon, it was absolutely dictatorship. Suppose a guest come to you, to your house. After a few minutes, you will find the police or detectives. They come and they take the guest to the military camp and they will send him away. If you want to open a radio on any station, you are not allowed to do so, particularly at the time of Nasser or any revolutionary country in the Middle East. They will come and they will listen behind the door. The fascists, when they make their press announcements, not only begin with saying that it's the duty of every Lebanese to kill a Palestinian, but that the case that they try to make out is that the Palestinians have come into Lebanon, and particularly into South Lebanon, to take everything over, that it's the Palestinians who are causing all the troubles, and of course the purpose of the Israeli shilling and the fascist shilling is try to frighten and panic the South Lebanese villagers and farmers into calling for the removal of the Palestinians, but that hasn't worked it's the other way around. And the reason it hasn't worked, as such strategies have never worked, they never worked in Vietnam, they never worked in the African countries, and they're not working here either, it starts from the situation that ordinary people are really living in. There are about 500,000 people living in South Lebanon, and at least half of them came down south in the course of the last two years during the war in Beirut. There's virtually no industry at all, about 500 jobs in the oil company, another 1,000 jobs in various forms of transport, about 500 workers who work in clerical jobs in the banks and so on. But apart from that, to make a living in South Lebanon, you have to be working either in tobacco or in citrus fruit production. Now, if you're a farmer working in tobacco, and there's about 30,000 families who are dependent upon planting and selling tobacco to live, you start off from the fact that even though you have some of the best soil that's available, either in the mountains or lower down, but even if you've got that soil, you have to get a license. Who do the licenses belong to, and who does the land actually belong to? The land belongs to a few landowners, most of whom live abroad. 
if you're going to use that land as a farmer, you have to get a license and you have to pay the absentee landowner 10,000 English pounds, 50,000 Lebanese pounds, in order to have a license to work it. To get that kind of money, you've got to go to the banks. And the banks charge anything between 12 up to 24%, and most of the tobacco farmers have to pay around 20% interest. And then you have to sell your tobacco, and all the farmers here, up until the last two years, had to sell their tobacco to the government, and the government sold it at the lowest possible prices. So the tobacco farmers were having to pay in order to work, and were losing money when they sold what they'd worked for. About 15,000 find their jobs working in the citrus orchards, three months of the year. Many of them migrant workers coming in, living in barns, in whatever's made available. And that's it. 500 fishermen, the whole of the coast of South Lebanon. When the fishermen went to the government two years ago and asked to be given a loan at decent interest rates so that they could set up a fish processing plant, they were given the thumbs down. If you look at the farmers working in the fields, they're working with plows that belong to 2,000 years ago. When an old man in Taibé talked to me, he told me how he and a number of other farmers in the area went to one of the big landowners, Kamal Assad, who owns most of the land, in fact, in South Lebanon, and they asked him if he would build a school in one of the villages. And Kamal Assad's answer to them was, I'd rather have a camel than have a school. A camel's more used to me than educating any of your children. And that's why the South Lebanese farmers, the South Lebanese families, have not panicked and they've not betrayed the Palestinians, but they've turned to the Palestinians and resist in the fiercest possible way the attempts of the fascists and the Israelis to destroy what is being built here. Regardless of whatever uh, criticisms we might level against the Palestine liberation movement, still represents the movement of the Arab masses. It is the only uh, hope in my mind to produce a revolutionary movement in the area. At the present time, it is concentrated in the south. The south is an area where we can build our revolutionary base. Due to political circumstances, it, there is no authority there. Authorities, wherever, wherever they might be, are counter-revolutionary. Now this is the area where we can really develop our institutions, build our forces. This is one thing. Second thing, we are a national liberation movement at the present time. National liberation for us means we want to liberate our country, which is Palestine. We are on the border of Palestine in the south. Uh, anywhere else, we will be too far away from Palestine. On the uh, struggle for Palestine, we can mobilize our people our, who are mainly concentrated in the camps who could see their land right across. It will give them the drive to rally around the movement. The so-called South in Lebanon is nothing but an extension of the Upper Galilee of Palestine geographically, ethnically, and historically, 
has been always one and the same part uh, through history. Uh, the Upper Galilee extends from in, in Palestine, from the road linking Acre to Safed, all the way to the Litani River. This is one block of mountains, and it is one and the same area, the same people. For me, as my name indicates, Shufani, I come from this area near Saidon, uh, Saida. Uh, my family lives both sides of the border, half of which is in Lebanese, the other half is Palestinian. So how could I recognize a border, a line that was drawn in, I think, 1926 between two imperialist powers, French and the British at the time? to split one clan into two halves. This is uh, totally uh, unacceptable uh, to me. Last week it became clear that there's the possibility of a big attack here on the south. What do you think is the objective of this sudden build-up by the Israelis behind and with the Kufur front? What is the military objective? First of all, the Israelis always had their uh, uh, dreams of getting hold of the South to uh, get uh, the need of water from the Litani. And uh, they would support any power that would collaborate uh, with them uh, and that would uh, uh, enable them to realize that dream. This is number one. Secondly, uh, if the uh, Lebanese front get hold of the south, that means a, gra a, a great part uh, of the uh, Cairo agreement would be cancelled. That means why should they argue about the Cairo agreement when they uh, took the whole south? Their main aim is to uproot uh, our existence in the uh, south. That would uh, give the uh, Lebanese uh, front, that would give them uh, more cards, and uh, uh, in the uh, interior settlement in, in Lebanon. And that would help them to go on the scheme of dividing uh, Lebanon. So, uh, and on uh, on, a, on a larger scale, uh, that would give the Israelis uh, uh, more cars 
and Geneva conference if it takes place this year. That means we would go there weaker. Uh, they would go there uh, stronger. Uh, that's why they insist on uh, attacking the south or supporting the uh, Lebanese front to attack the south. Though, though, although they failed for about two or three times, uh, now they are preparing for a major attack, thinking that uh, that would uh, uh, enable them to get hold of the south. Three times every day, my, sometime every day, three times. Every day, every day, all night. About 50 bombs, 60 bombs, all night. What kind of bombs are they? From Israel. Mm. From Israel is gone. Every time, from Israel. All houses, 155, 175. They have uh, their reasons to apply such uh, a scheme. Menachem Begin said it once that after the massacre of Der Yassin, their troops uh, went through Palestine as a knife into uh, a butter, into butter. It was easier for them to get hold of Palestine after each massacre because that would scare the people, that would make the villagers uh, run away, and that uh, means their job in occupying the Arab villages uh, was easy. When they entered the town, they uh, he banged on the door and he asked him to raise his hands. I didn't raise my hands because I didn't understand. So he fired. He told him, why are you firing? He told him, where's the clashing? With uh, very heavy Arabic. It's not Arabic. He told him, clashing, there is no clashing. I have only the stick. So he's not Kataib or fascist. He must be an Israeli. Because his Arabic was very heavy, broken Arabic. There was no armed presence here, except from the village itself, the people of the village itself. The war was in Beirut first. When squad squad in Beirut, they started in the south. They started shelling, continuous shelling, so a lot of people were forced to leave. Now we're just a few number here. The fascists came here. When they arrived here, through the slaughtering and the things they've done here, the people ran away. This is the town of uh, the deputy speaker, isn't it? Yes, it's the uh, hometown of Kamal Assad, deputy speaker of the parliament for a number of years. The walls are cracked through that shell also. And what, does, what do you think of Kamal Assad? No. What do you Kamal Assad? What do you Kamal Assad? All the, time, we, we, all the time we voted for him, 
لو ما قلوش حاضر لو كان بي واما خيي ما قلوش حاضر ما كان حدا فاتح البيت He said, uh, if he didn't support what's happened here, the fascists or the Zionists wouldn't have been able to enter this village. So, do you know, uh, when they blew up his house uh, about the beginning of the Lebanese civil war because of his stand, political stand. So, uh, he said, it's like a personal revenge he had, even if it's home, his hometown. He doesn't mind sacrificing it for his own revenge. You mean the villages blew up, Kamal Hassan's yes, house? Yes, the citizens yes. of this village blew mm. up his house because he stands up for a feudal leader mm. that owned the land, the houses, the people. And how did you get rid of the feudal leadership in the Union? إحدى المواقع الأمامية خطوط التماس مع العدو الصهيوني والنازليين يجب أن نتصرف هون بحذر لأن هناك قناصة إسرائيليين وقناصة كتائبيين صح أننا سنوفر لك كل الحماية من أسلحة الإسناد وأسلحة الرشاشة جاهزة الآن إلا أنه أرجو مرة أخرى أن نتصرف بحذر بإمكانكم تتفضلوا بس واحد واحد وبحذر أرجو أن تجعلوا رؤوسكم مواطية شوي أوكي إحنا الآن أمام موقع مدفع ميم دال مباشر أمام العدو الإسرائيلي والصهيوني على مسافة حدود 400 متر أمامنا العدو الإسرائيلي والصهيوني الانعزالي في كازينو عين إبل هذا الموقع هو نقطة التماس الأمامية للعدو بشكل مستمر هاي فيصور إذا كان بإمكانه يصور You are facing the village of Ain Ebel. That's a Zionist and fascist control village. Uh, with the building that you can see in front of you is uh, the headquarters of the fascists. Their 
most advanced position. And there they lost a tank last week. There's Israeli and fascist snipers stretched stretch around that building and that position. يرمي يرمي خليهم يخسرون على الانجليز 20 30 طلقه. He's going to answer back again. Yes. ايش بدهم طلقه لبعض؟ عرض نفسهم للخطر. He's saying, the comrade is saying, what's, what's the end with you? <laughs> How is it going to end with you? And how was Hani killed? He murdered um, last year on the 11th of April in 1976 in Antura Heights in Lebanon while he was filming the struggle between the Palestinian Lebanese um, joint uh, revolution 
and the fascist forces. I don't know if I will continue this march or not. It's not a picnic. Definite. To have this earth in his hand. Because we have uh, this very strong unity between uh, all our comrades, all our people. Uh, and because we have this people, the Palestinian people who is ready to give sacrifices for their aim and for their target, to return back to their homelands. Who they had been kicked out from this homeland. They had been kicked out from this homeland uh, through a very uh, fierce conspiracy. We have a just, justice uh, uh, cause. We are not against Jews. We are against Zionism. And uh, you remember that uh, the first slogan which you gave? We said that we, our aim is to establish our, in our democratic Palestinian state where Muslims, Christians, and Jews can live together. Together. And I'm saying now, they are speaking about settlement. And they, and they are insisting to leave this settlement. Okay. I am saying, why, why, why to speak about settlement? Why not to speak about to live all together in this uh, homeland? I am offering this by the name of my people. We, we don't want to harm anybody. And we are uh, insisting to, uh, to speak frankly to our people. We don't give them, them lessons to be terrorists or to be uh, fascists or to be nazi, uh, nazists. Without a civilized theory, ideological theory, you can have this victory. And uh, I think that uh, in the future, all the Jews will understand that uh, we are fighting for them too. I can't, I can't, I can't imagine that uh, without this, uh, this uh, ideological theory, with, uh, without this uh, uh, touches, human being touches, we can carry on, on uh, in our fighting in this very hard circumstances around us. With a very strong platform from the theory, we can carry on. Fascism, Zionism, and Nazism can't push any revolution. It is human touches who can give the victory. And we are teaching our people from this 
angle and easy to channel and nothing else. And we are proud of it. At least we are, we can say that we are freedom fighter. Actual freedom fighter. You can't say a slogan without uh, uh, without, uh, يعني بدون أن تنفذوا على ال على الطبيعة. Without <coughs> without putting that into practice. Without putting that into uh, into, into practice, you can't. Slogans only? No. Means nothing. Slogans, but practice. Very important. And for this. 13 years of very hard fighting and struggling against Likud, as an example, against CIA, against uh, all these uh, huge enemies against us. Yes, yes, assassinations inside our occupied territories and outside. Fascism, Nazism, Zionism. We are here and we are still fighting because we are in the correct way. And without this, human being touches. You can't carry on in this long and hard march. It is a fact and it is a law in the revolution. And without it, you can't have any victory. You can't, you can't arrive your target. And you can't say that you are a freedom fighter without this uh, very clear line between black and white. And we are very careful that our line must be clear and light. So, you see these kids and these flowers. They are speaking with this confidence. With these human touches. And they can't, we can't, we can't accept anything far away from that. Perhaps, and definitely, you, you agree of uh, what I have uh, mentioned, definitely. Yes. Thank you very much. I have sent you, because you give this, uh, me this opportunity. At least, maybe I am not uh, a good speaker in English, especially. But at least, to give me this opportunity to to express my feeling, my thoughts for the the thoughts of my revolution, the thoughts of my people. I'm definite. All these honourable persons all this uh, freedom fighter all over the world is standing firmly and strongly with my people, with my cause. Because, because we are standing in the same trench with them.
three elements. An idea, the people, the people who, is, who believe in this idea, and a gun. And in my opinion too, a gun without an idea, ideological theory behind it, it is a gangster.